Excellent. Uh, this is the Metasploit demo meeting for April 3rd, 2018. Um, we'll start off with a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first one, I think Brent, you added this. This was the uh, Google Summer of Code uh, submission window just closed, and we had a lot of applications in there. I've kind of kept an eye on, it. kept a little bit of an eye on it, but there's been a lot of activity that I missed out on. I don't know if we uh, if we have anything we can say definitively yet, or if we can give an idea of when um, folks will have some feedback. Well, I, I'd say. Definitively, we can say we have a lot of great applications, Definitely. and uh, we, we've been looking over them, and I've been really impressed by a lot of them. And uh, we'll basically be able to put out a general announcement about who, who won on April 23rd. Um, that's pretty much all we can say publicly. Uh, Google kind of tries to keep, help us, <laughs> it encourages us to not really do a whole lot other than that until the yeah. personal announcements go out. 43 applications. I noticed, I noticed some of the folks, that, uh, some of the organizations that were uh, sponsoring students weren't sure how many slots they have. Do we know yet how many, how many applicants oh, they yeah. have? Oh, well, that's another great thing. So we have to submit how many slots we would like by the, I think that's the 9th. 9th. And um, after that point, Google will decide, uh, do the slot allocations based on um, how long your organization has been doing Google Summer Code, um, how many you actually want, um, how many uh, mentors and that sort of stuff. So basically they can look at what can you handle and uh, they'll, they'll give you that many slots. And that's why you don't say who won, because you don't know how many slots you're gonna have. Gotcha, so okay. Everyone's put in their bids. Everyone could be a winner. Yeah. Perfect. But it's not, not that Metasploit is a two-year-old uh, project. We, um, at least in Google Summer Code terms, uh, we have a, a, a slot, a shot at getting more slots. <laughs> <laughs> cool, awesome. So looking forward to more info of that. We'll keep everybody posted. Uh, other big announcement is that Rapid7 is hiring, and I know we have a, a number of slots open, but uh, we've actively been looking for a security researcher right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a software sort of engineer position we have open uh, for, for a junior as well, and we also have a product manager position open for, for the Metasploit offensive security and uh, unsight fish teams. Okay, very cool. Uh, yeah, and since it's a junior position, I think that's exciting. I, uh, whenever I've had an opportunity to work kind of as a mentor role, I've always told people, just apply, even if you don't think you deserve it, because mm -hmm. it's not your job to say no. Like it's someone else's job to say you can't do it. So exactly, uh, give it a shot. What's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. um, you'll end up right where you are now, but uh, you should absolutely try. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's anything we can say about uh, the the kind of skill set we're looking for or kind of pre qualifications. Well, it helps to like Metasploit. <laughs> it helps to uh, know how to code. Um, it's certainly something we're looking for: is people who are enthusiastic, ready to learn. Hungry, and uh, live in Austin. So yeah, okay. those are all things that were, or at least can move to Austin. So, what about uh, students, like university students that haven't quite graduated yet? Are they still within a window, or should they stay tuned for later? I would say May graduates are probably really good. Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, uh, if folks want to apply, where do they go? Uh, you can go to rapid7.com. Uh, click careers, I believe is the link, okay. um, and uh, all the job postings are listed there. Or you can follow me um, on Twitter Which or, should be or Wei Chen, and uh, we definitely tweeted those as well. Awesome, very cool. Uh, and then the big thing for us in the room this week is the new office, um, which I've, I've stolen. Uh, I think it was Robbie's picture of uh, our. Well, 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 I didn't, actually, I didn't have mine. What, what was in the bottle? What was the thing? Huh? Champagne. 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 It's champagne. It's champagne. It's it's champagne. champagne. It's it was it's bubble wine. Okay, we're bubble bath. We're drinking bubble bath. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, we're we're now in the frost tower. So if you're if you're uh, thinking of, of working for us, now's a great time to join our swanky office. So we've had a lot of new exploit modules, and I missed out on quite a few of these. So I don't know if there's any that we wanted to highlight. Um, Actually, this was just over the last week. Um, oh, so uh, there was a, there a couple more um, from the previous week. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff that went in. Um, I could talk about some of them. But uh, I guess the one that I know the most about is the, the Google, the Joomla component fields, SQL RCE. Uh, Joomla is used in a lot of places. So it's pretty important that um, it you know, be a nice, stable app. Uh, Joomla is a, like a, is a CMS. So it basically lets people run blogs and mm -hmm. websites. So this is a lot of public facing stuff. That's right, yeah. Um, and the last time we've had Joomla exploits, uh, they've, they've uh, definitely um, kind of revealed a lot of different vulnerabilities, especially within like university settings. Uh, you find Joomla deployed a lot in there. Nice, cool. Uh, did anybody else want to chat about any of these or uh, anything that I missed? Because I know there's some that aren't on the list. 
Get stack. Did you want to uh, talk about get stack some, Jacob? Yeah, Jacob. Uh, yeah, we talk about it. I think we've mentioned it before in past meetings, but um, for this one, there was a uh, command injection vulnerability. Um, so they, they just basically pass one of your arguments <laughs> straight to uh, an exec command. And uh, there's a few conditions that had to be um, set. Basically, it needs to be in a vulnerable state, but all the requests to put it in that state are available to a, an unauthenticated user. Um, so you could check for the conditions, set them if you need to, uh, run the exploit and undo it. So pretty straightforward, but also I assume that means pretty reliable. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, any, any that I missed on up here? I don't think so. One that actually landed, um, uh, we talked about it last time, but, but actually landed this round was the Kerberos hosting modules. Oh, um, yeah. Supported by the Python uh, external module functionality premium, the impact at work. That was another one that uh, Jacob brought in for us. Um, that actually landed the, this last week. So Yeah, and I hear we might have four or five more uh, in that same thing coming along soon. There are rumors. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so a lot of another, other notable improvements. And I know, Brent, you spent some time on our weekly wrap-up talking about Goliath and some major milestones that um, James and I'm sure quite a few other folks have contributed to. Right, yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I would say the first step of Goliath got pushed in, which is the, basically the framework for, for running the external data service and, and actually having Metasploit interact with it. As, um, uh, as we continue works in this effort, um, we will be converting more of the data model. Right now, about 50% of the Metasploit data model is converted. I think we actually may be closer to like, let's say, 80%? I'm looking at Matthew. He's kind of grinning at me. Chris is looking to the left. <laughs> <laughs> we have a few more that should be landing very soon. Okay. PR soon. Yeah, so, so those will have to be going as PRs rather than sort of the big bang commits um, that we did for that one. But, uh, but now the, the, the structure is there, um, it's easier to add more, more code. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, improved performance will allow us to build some really neat data services on top of it, and maybe do some external integration. So I'm looking forward to it. And definitely check out the weekly blog post. It has a lot more information about where we're going with it. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I, I just noticed this, and this totally slipped past me. Error handling with Android screenshots. I don't know what that's. So, that so this, this is like a long, a long standing source of confusion with users. Um, normally, when you want to take a screenshot of, let's say, an operating system, that's something that a normal user can do, right? You just hit the right buttons and you get a screenshot and you can do it. So, a lot of interpreters have that ability as well. Android interpreter also can take screenshots. However, due to Android's uh, enhanced, I guess you could say, security APIs, you can only take screenshots of yourself if you're an application, except for maybe like one blessed application that can hook all the, the key, the buttons. Right. Um, so normally when you're running as Android interpreter, you can't actually take a screenshot of yourself. And what Android actually gives you is like an empty screen. Um, so you can uh, so like fail OSs. silently. Yeah, basically. Uh, so we actually check that now and we'll, we'll say, hey, here's the reason why you couldn't take a screenshot rather than people reporting bugs, because that bug gets reported a lot. <laughs> and, yeah, and this is more or less kind of a, a defensive measure. It now tells you that Basically, if you want to take a screenshot of an app, Android app, you actually have to inject into that app and run it from the app's context. Okay, cool. So if you, if you app packaged your interpreter in, you'd be able to take a screenshot of what you app packaged into as your, in, as your injection, but just not when you just happen to have gotten a shell on the system. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Uh, Brennan, you talked a little bit about command in the blog post this week, but I don't know if you wanted to give a quick overview of right. So, so command is Rabbit Seven's new automation platform. We uh, they joined the team last year, and they're working really hard to uh, to build some neat integrations between different projects within Rabbit Seven. Um, one of the things that they recently added was this notion of a command automation plugin. What you can basically do with it right now. Is, I'll admit, it's not a whole lot. It's basically kind of a skeleton to, to sort of gauge interest and get more feedback from people. But what you can do is basically you can load the plugin, and from the plugin, you can send data to command. Uh, right now, it just takes a freeform blob, and you just send a blob to command. Command can then use that as part of its automation pipeline to do other things. Um, definitely check out command online. You can read more about it. I don't want to go to the entirety of what command actually does. But um, what we're looking for probably in the future is to maybe even integrate the um, plugin into things that Goliath does because command is all about actually processing the output like module runs, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we'll get some feedback and some interest in, and we'll find out what, what people want to do from an offensive point of view with commands automation. Cool. 
uh, and then MS seventeen ten. Oh was yeah, this huge. was really cool. Yeah, so so Will Vu worked a whole lot on this with with uh, Zero Sum and, and uh, Auxilis and, and some others. But basically, uh, with MS seventeen oh one oh, we have uh, two or three modules right now that are used quite a bit. Uh, one of the newest one is the MS seventeen oh one oh PS Exec module. Now with this one, um, you actually have to have a named pipe available on a Windows system in order for it to run properly. Um, it needs to either be anonymously accessible or needs uh, some sort of authentication. But to really know what pipes are available, you basically have to do kind of a, um, let's say kind of a, 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 a go-buster sort of operation where you basically just try a bunch of pipe names and see which ones work. Uh, previously, that module required the user to either get the name right from the first try or, or guess for themselves or do their own auditing operation. Now it can actually do it all automatically. So basically it's a lot more fire and forget. Uh, another funny thing is because uh, that, that module doesn't use uh, uh, CPU specific shellcode, it actually works on ARM uh, <coughs> machines as well. And so uh, Zero Sum actually got himself an ARM RT Windows um, tablet yeah. from a store and it was immediately exploitable by this. No change, nothing at all. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All, all we had to do basically is uh, um, add, uh, just whitelist it. <laughs> allow okay. the module to run on it. So, so now Mesplay actually has auditing support against ARM tablets running Windows. Yeah. That's pretty nifty. That's awesome. Uh, so this, this uh, list is just from this week's blog post. I've missed anything previous. Is there anything anybody wants to chat about or anything I missed on the list here? Just a quick sanity check. Oh. Um, so yeah, and then we've kind of been doing this, you know, things to watch out for in the future. And Brent, I, was this, I think, all, entirely your this? They all do this. This, yeah. this is thing Brent thinks is, is cool to look at. Yes. <laughs> things I think are cool. Uh, so some of these so, have been definitely making the rounds. Some of them are a little more. So you know, let me talk a little bit about the Berkeley Privileges um, uh, Berkeley packet filter. So uh, this is there's this neat little language that came out like in the early '80s, maybe late '70s. I don't know. That basically it was initially designed to allow you to filter packets from like let's say let's say you set up a, a raw socket listener um, within your operating system, and you only want to get uh, packets from like uh, IP address 192.168.1.1. You can create a Berkeley packet filter, which is kind of a specialized assembly language. Now originally this assembly language just had match instructions and it had um, uh, jump to forward instructions. It basically was kind of like a one-way assembly language. Just check, like, see if this IP address matches, yeah. and if not, if or not, so. If not, return one, yeah. so it returns zero, that kind of thing. And so it was really great, um, safe, um, high performance, <laughs> uh, easy to implement, um, all that kind of good stuff. Well, and, we, and we stopped there, and everything was great. And we stopped there, and everything was great for a couple of decades. And then Linux decided to use this language everywhere. And they added loops, and they added nesting, and they added validations, and they added just-in-time compilers, and they added all kinds of awesome stuff. And so, one of the consequences of <laughs> awesome stuff is uh, you also sometimes forget things. And so, uh, this is one of many Berkeley packet filter vulnerabilities that Linux has had over the past four or five years. And uh, Hoodie recently created a new uh, pull request to exploit one of them. Nice, so, nice, nice work there. So. <laughs> Long story short, uh, Linux gets more complex and there's a lot more attack surface. And this is basically any user is able to create these Berkeley packet filters. Um, and basically what that means is you're able to run arbitrary code within the kernel. Wow. So fun stuff. Yeah. So this is, there, it's actually kind of ironically, um, I think, actually I forget if this one's the one or not, but I believe one of the current um, vulnerabilities out there was in the validator in the kernel to ensure that the Berkeley packet filter program was oh, safe. Oh no. It itself was exploitable. Wow. <laughs> so the irony of that. That's bad news. Uh, OK, so UDP channel support for uh, Meterpreter. Yeah. That's been a long time. Yeah, we, uh, a couple of Meterpreters so far have support for this. Um, Python was notably missing, which caused some confusion when people would say, hey, this suddenly doesn't work anymore. But basically, this allows you to run UDP post modules, exploits, whatever, through Python Meterpreter as well as we could argue on Windows and, and Linux and all that other Meterpreters. Yeah. So that's some good, good enhancements there. Yeah. Um, something I kind of like a lot is that uh, the, the WebKit um, Trident exploit. Now this one has actually kind of been working for a while, but the neat thing that, that Tim Wright recently got working with this is he's actually able to load an interpreter with that one as well. Originally the payload size was limited to like 65K, um, and so he managed to bump that up by including Metal's binary right into the exploit shellcode, and it huh. apparently works at that point. Okay. Um, he's still working through some details, but um, this should be really interesting. So basically this is one of the, I believe this is one of the pwn to own 
um, uh, exploits from a couple of years ago. Okay. But uh, this is one of the first time we converted that into something that runs straight with the Metasploit. Now you do have to have a slightly older version of OS X, but if you have slightly version OS X hardware, then Apple probably isn't updating you anyway. So right, yeah. um, Vulnerable. Just you know, clicking yeah. later every every two days when it comes up and says, "Yeah, I'm updated." So check out my iMac. Get her a Chromebook instead. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's actually kind of a rough week for Apple uh, since they've got the the encrypted volume password disclosure too. Mm -hmm. That one's pretty straightforward. So yes, yeah. we'll we'll see that one coming up soon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so from that, if we want to pivot into kind of the individual teams, and we can talk a little bit more in detail. Uh, who's up for script kitties? Um, I can handle that one. Um, so uh, a couple of things we did um, uh, in support of the SMBC uh, pipe auditing work, we actually uh, re-implemented or brought back in our implementation of being able to do serial testing in the payload uh, automation framework so that uh, things like the Eternal Blue and uh, other various vulnerabilities there can actually be run. Um, there's a, a, some really specific timing issues there that have that, that essentially require a um, a nice quiet environment while you're testing it um, to make sure that it works every single time. Um, so when we were trying to, originally trying to run that, we would run it uh, against multiple targets at the same time and we'd get timeouts and failures and, and really low reliability, but this uh, allows us to run each test in serial. Um, it runs against one target at a time completes it and gives us back the results, comes back a lot better uh, in terms of reliability. Um, still not 100% reliable, but much, much better than what we had. Nice. Um, uh, another thing we did was uh, expanded on the test automation framework uh, environment we have in Jenkins to allow us to run all of our payload tests um, within reasonable time frames now. Um, we can run, it takes about 11 hours now to run the full, uh, to run the full test framework. Um, and we can actually, uh, Previously, we were failing out at the first failure, um, or the first uh, architecture failure. Um, now we're actually running all of the architectures, so we can see all the er all the errors that we have, so we can try and go and fix them. Um, that's actually uh, leading us to some stuff in the payload automation um, that we're trying to get landed um, for improving the IP addresses we get back from those systems, because that's actually having an impact on what our results look like. Um, uh, another thing we discussed uh, a little bit last week as we're working on the Cryptilby implementations for Python and Metal, um, we found uh, that we may actually want to look at look back at expanding or mod modifying the algorithms that we're using, both for key exchange as well as for communication, um, just to make them a little bit more compatible and to reduce the dependencies that we might have, uh, especially within Metroper, uh for Python right now. Um, as Python has no crypto built in, so whatever we can implement ourselves um, uh, easily uh, and, and, and quickly is going to be a, is going to be a win for us so we don't have to have people we don't have to rely on whether or not somebody's Python environment happens to have a pip install of, uh, of a crypto library already there for us cool um, uh, and then uh, Sunny spent a lot of time uh, in, last week getting our commercial release out um, clearing out some of our uh, uh, some of the bugs we had uh, in Pro, uh, also supporting 64-bit uh, interpreter as a, as, as a default and a, a more easily selectable option. Um, when you're running uh, when, when you're running payload tests, that actually uh, improves on our ability to use the Mimikatz functionality in 64-bit interpreter. Um, uh, when you're when you're running Pro, um, we verified some VPN pivoting, and we uh, also uh, had a customer reported issue with uh, Unicode support in the social engineering phishing campaigns. Um, where some emails when delivered um, with specific Unicode characters in them would uh, would fail to decode properly, and, and, and it's just a, a big hint that, that, that you're being fished. Um, so we, we improved on that a little bit, too. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Dharma, Dharma Initiative. Do we... Uh, hmm? We can talk about some of that. Uh, yeah. uh, so, um, Python external module documentation mm -hmm. that was uh, added to the wiki and referenced in one of the blog posts that went out. Um, so it kind of provides some information about uh, the code that goes into um, making running external modules possible, as well as giving it a small example of creating a external Python module. Um, there, there's uh, some links in there to point to like other resources about the ERB that's used to generate the Ruby documents and 
um, some of the other underlying code that checks the metadata uh, for what's required for external modules. Um, it also includes a uh, zero Steiner's uh, logging uh, implementation. If you want to use the built-in logging functionality instead of using the uh, module.log, it's really just a wrapper around the Python um, Mesploit library that we currently have for logging. Uh, but it allows you to use the default logging handler. Um, See, so get users SPN, that's the Kerberos module. Um, that one, uh, impact it is required for it. Uh, tried to use the pip install impact it version that was available, but there's some issues with that. So you end up just deciding to go with the, uh, you need to kind of install the dev version of impact it to use that. Um, okay. And I'll cover the last three. So we have something working for the the pros dynamic the pails. Um, and what does it like? What does that do? Or that's mouse wave pros payload specifically with an extra evasive, you know, uh, ability against you know, antivirus. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, doing the Spawn emulator um, as a Debian package that we that way we can deploy it in honeypots. And I'm sorry. What, what is the Vuln emulator? What's it do? Oh, that, that simulates uh, vulnerable services so you can point uh, uh, the uh, Metasploit framework to it and so you can test out some modules. Okay. But uh, for this particular one, we emphasize the, the, simula uh, the simulation of uh, Tomcat uh, service. So a user can, uh, you know, you can emulate a Tomcat service so you can use a coin tool using the browser. It looks just like a Tomcat service and then you can go into the manager uh, application so you have to authenticate. There's a list of passwords you can try. If you succeed it, you may be happy. You can be uploading a WAR file, and then you might say trying to uh, exploit, right? It's all fake, first of all. Yeah, very and cool. Then, uh, and then for this Debian package, we have uh, some services for Apache Tomcats. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully, that one day we can deploy in the honeypot, and then we can observe how attackers attack uh, Tomcats, basically. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the last one is uh, Metasm, that is the C headers for Metasm. Uh, I worked on this because, well, I mean, I still, I'm still working on this because it's really not easy to write something uh, in Metasm, write C code and then let it, let it compile because you don't have any headers to begin with. So whatever function you use, you have to start from scratch or you have to like, declare the headers and all that. So, that's a lot of work, so it would be nice to have something already built in by default, so we can just use it. And I'm gonna uh, demonstrate a little bit in the demo. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that brings us to abnormal form. Sure. So we, as mentioned earlier, got Goliath landed to master. Mm -hmm. So that's a big step, right? But that is a big step, and now we can start landing directly to a, a normal PR stuff stream. So that's nice. Uh, currently in the works is notes and workspaces. I'm converting notes uh, for the remote data service. Uh, interestingly, the data field is serialized. That's posed some issues for pushing server-side search and um, fixing an issue in the sort option. I don't know if anyone's sorted notes recently, but it didn't seem to work in 4x, so I guess not. It just, just ignored it or? It, it, it breaks. Ooh, okay, all right, well. But I'm fixing it. Excellent. It'll all be better. All right. Love a demo where sort works. <laughs> and I've been working on workspaces. Um, this one, <laughs> we, we kind of underestimated how big of a change this would be because everything relies on workspaces in the current data model. Um, one of the big changes that we had to make to make it work with the remote uh, data service is moving the tracking of it outside to the client side. It used to just all be handled within the DB manager and you just would figure out what the current workspace was there. Now um, we have to move all that to the client because multiple people might be using different workspaces at the same time, or you know, if you connect to a different uh, data store, that same workspace may not exist. Um, so that had to all be moved out. So now you have to pass in workspace as an option when you didn't previously have to, so that all had to be converted. It's gonna be a pretty big PR, but um, uh, hopefully it will the way for a bright future. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. A lot of this work, I think, that's falls very much in that category. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I can try pushing this button. There we go. 
Yeah, wait, if you want to... Uh, oh, what was it, Ms. Hazel? My turn, okay. Yep. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, one of the reasons I worked on this because uh, I've been trying to, you know, evade antivirus, I'm not going to name one in this meeting. Um, one of the challenges, the most difficult challenges, because, you know, Minnesota has, you know, so many shuttles, we have to be able to support that. So, but the problem is, as soon as you put your shell code in your, in your program, you get caught immediately. So, like pop to me detected? Yes, okay. you, get, you, get, yeah. you get caught immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so one, one workaround for that is you either encode it, not from one of the encoders, no, that's not gonna work. You build your own custom encoder or you actually encrypt it. That way, when you you know generate your your program with the shell code in it, you're not gonna get caught when as soon as you put it on disk. Okay, and this is really challenging when 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 you try to do it from Ruby um, or as a Metasploit module, whatever. Because so one thing that we use is using Metasm to uh, compile C. Um, and this is not easy to use at all because you don't have headers to play with to, to, to begin with. So like I said, whatever function you use, you have to declare all that from scratch. Um, and this is just not developer friendly at all. Um, I remember in the beginning, I, you know, I tried to work on this. I asked people, hey, how do you, how do you guys compile something, uh, compile C with Metasm? Like nobody was able to answer me because it's just not easy at all. Um, so I spent some time working on, you know, building this. So, um, so I have this example here. Basically, the way I want to do it is I want to make it feel like you're developing, you know, you know C original C as, as much as possible. So here I have these includes, and basically what happens uh, under the hood is basically uh, it, this is an ERB template, and I'm basically looking for the include uh, keyword, and I'm converting those in in this basically and then but I'm just like loading all the headers for example um, if I'm including the windows.h and then this will be actually load uh, the windows.h file you know, with all these obviously I have to add these you have to add these manually did you type all these in manually? I did. <laughs> you, you, you didn't just strip them from the H files. No, because oh, I they need don't to, work, right? Yeah, I need you to make sure they work. So you you end up typing all of them. Um, you know, there's a couple more for say this and this, something like that. Anyways, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Manual work, <laughs> um, but they're very easy. You mean intern? We <laughs> yeah. should build a post processor for that. Yeah, so just uh, um, this is great. I mean, this looks like a normal C program. It's yeah, not like a Metasm kind just of just like a normal thing. C program. The, yeah. One of the the only problem I've seen so far is I cannot printf and actually see the message. Although printf actually works because when you run this this printf here, it actually returns the number of characters. Mm -hmm. Print it, except you can't see that. That's the problem. So you can print it a different way and see the number. I guess. So yeah. you can, if you're debugging, you can. I guess you can use this, mm -hmm. and you can see debugging messages from there. Um, so, and this is this should be very quick. Uh, I uh, so, for example, if I do it like that, so now it just compiles, and then let me go find the file. Okay, copy, and I have a lot of files. Um, you should clean your desktop. I know. So a couple things I was trying. Uh, so so first I'm, I'm I try to print something and I return the number of characters, and I try to create a file and then basically I write the the number of characters printed to to the file. Um, which is here, I make sure I can use message box, which is useful for debugging purpose. I make sure I can allocate memory, I make sure I can create a process, and I make it, I make sure I can do this for, for network API programming. Um, so let's see if it works. So yeah, that's a, you know, uh, virtual alloc, and that's the create process. Uh, looks like this green stock is 
working and it looks like I can write it to a file. So yeah, uh, one interesting thing about using Metasm is it's pain in the ass too. It's not very straightforward to reverse engineer. For example, one, one thing you do with when you reverse a binary is look up a string and you find out which function is using that string, okay? So what you do is, so I cannot access to IDA right now. I don't have to because this service, the service now. So one interesting thing is when you, when you find a string, so usually you do a cross-reference, cross okay? And you find a function. But when you cross-reference, when the, when the program is compiled by Metasm, it, IDA doesn't know how to find it. Same thing with uh, functions. Like you find a function, oh, where, where, where's, which function is calling this one? But IDA doesn't know. So that's, that's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So Is it because it doesn't actually create functions and just inlines everything? Or is that more just, IDA just doesn't know how to understand that assembly? I don't think IDA understands how to parse it. That's the thing, yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Although it's also maybe a red flag. So by so using Metasm, you're kind of evading. Uh, it's kind of in high reversing. You, 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 you're you're, you're obfuscating a bit. Yeah. I, I, so I have a question. When you're when you're processing through those header files, are you just loading? Are you just loading the entire thing? If, you, yeah. if there was an include, or are you loading only yeah, the so, ones that are actually? So this is the actual actual source code. So when you write it, it looks like this. But when you when you compile it, you shut everything in one file. So it's, it's a Ruby C preprocessor. Yeah. That's neat. Did you use uh, the tiny C compiler within Ruby to do the compiling? Uh, I heard the bright Metasm, Metasm is a C compiler. Oh, okay. So yeah, basically, but it's, there's no tiny C compiler. It's just, oh. it's just all Ruby. It's pretty amazing, <laughs> actually. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's actually the right way to implement it, but this is what I have so far. Well, it gives a definitely a much better user experience oh, from yeah, the developer. Oh, sure, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna share my screen now. Sweet. Let's see. Uh, so I, I can't share my screen while another person is participating. There you go. There we go. That sounds delicious. Yeah, it, it is delicious. Let's see. If I do this right. It's giving you something. Yeah. It worked. I'm so excited. All right. So I was doing some Qnix stuff before I came to this meeting, so I'm not totally set up, but I will go ahead and try it. So um for this, this weekend, I thought I would sit down and, and write a new module. Um, there's one I've always been wanting to write, but I just never had time. So this seemed like just the perfect time to do it. So uh, have you ever been working together with a team member and you really need to synchronize your, your <coughs> actions exactly? Like say you have a team member who's going into the data center, he's going to uh, install the implant, and you want to make sure that your listener is only up for a certain amount of time and, and then shuts down. Um, automatically because maybe you don't have time to just watch it and hit control C or kill the job or whatever. Um, so what's, what's a good way to do that? Well, I came up with just the perfect solution and I'll show it to you. Um, it's a variation of um, exploit multi-handler. Um, use exploit multi, but rather than exploit multi-handler, um, it's some steamed hams. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so steamed hams are what I call a multi-handler. Um, it's it's a Nalini expression. <laughs> <laughs> so let me show you how this model works. You're gonna um, have a really rough next few minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is steamed hands, but it's a Metasploit module. Um, if you don't quite get this joke, um, this is kind of a meme that's been going on the internet for a while. And and basically, steamed hands is an old Simpsons gag from I don't know maybe the mid '90s or so. But recently. People have been doing steamed hands in different ways. Steamed hands, but it's improvisational community theater, that sort of thing. So this is the Metasploit module version of it. Um, I'll show you the first target. Um, first of all, what you have is you can set your payload. Let's see, um, Mac OS, uh, not Mac OS, it's called OS X, isn't it? Darn it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OS X, X64, reverse speed, set all host. All right, so we'll go ahead and run it. And you can see here, um, you get actually uh, this sort of time script that goes by and, uh, and re reenacts uh, Steam Hams. Oh, I forgot. It has actually, this is also a really cool feature. Um, show targets. It actually has multiple targets. Um, so the first one is Steam Hams. So you can say set target zero and run it. Um, and you will actually have Chalmers. Well, Seymour made it despite your directions. Skinner, ah, Superintendent Chalmers, welcome. Hope you're prepared for an unforgettable luncheon. Um, and so it'll actually go through the whole script, um, and it's pretty neat. There's actually a dynamic script running engine built into it that automatically does dynamic timing. 
um, we'll, we'll inject the right emojis for, for the right people as they appear. Um, there's actually a little, a little uh, scripting engine that you can, you can run to add your own um, sort of plays and that sort of thing as they run along. And you can actually get sessions with it as well. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, silence. <laughs> 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 Just a second. Let's see if I can get a um, a shell before it runs out of time. So is that generating an application bundle or just a macro file? It's just a macro file. Just a macro file. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're in the last act. Oh no. Trans and have completed. Oh, yes. oh no. I didn't beat it. <laughs> 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 it wasn't fast enough. Do it in one line. Oh, yeah, you're right. I should do that. Do it in and in. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. to mine it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to. Ah. Oh. <laughs> you, you, you got the script stuff. Yeah, wrong. Right, let's try it again. Uh, okay. And in. Uh, yeah. You missed an and in. Thank you. Yeah. All right, ready? You can talk, you can talk, you can talk, you can talk. I can sing. <laughs> Where's the difference between zero and one? Uh, they do a different. <laughs> oh. oh no, yeah, I mean, Oh well. Uh, oh, I know. It has the same directory. Let's see. Uh, Darwin. Let's see. In metal. Uh, let's see. And by the way, if you didn't know, metal actually takes arguments. So let's see. Let's see. We want to connect to URL, TCP. All right. There we hey. go. Ha ha. Oh, the problem is that I use the staged version. So we need yeah. to use the new Metasm stuff to create new stages. Oh, okay. And I, sh I should have used stageless, and it would have evaded fine. So anyway, we got an interpreter shell. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time for it to finish up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my demonstration for the week. Bravo. <laughs> Uh, who's, who do we have? Do, do, do. Let's look here. I closed my tabs too quick. Are you up? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Cool. All right, so this is just a quick, I guess, refresh demo for Abnormal Form, just showing um, both the server side running and then the client interacting with it. And you know, showing a little bit of the lower level API, uh, REST API direct interaction. Um, so just to show that I have no tricks up the sleeve. Um, this is the local database that I'm currently on on my system, so there's some data in it. I'm gonna connect to the data service running in a VM. If I run host again, you'll see that I'm empty because it is a blank clear database. I'm going to run DDNMAP, which now works with the remote data store. And it's going to scan Metasploitable 2 that I have running in a VM as well, just because it's lightweight and it has a lot of services. It's not running on this, right? It's running VMs on the system. It's running, it's running in a local VM. Oh, okay. Right. So now the scan is complete. We have a host registered and a number of services. Just to up it even more, I want to create 
some Vuln uh, records. So I'm going to run a quick script to get root on exploitable using the IRCD. What year is that? Hey, it's mess with you. <laughs> it's lightweight. It doesn't take up a lot of resources. <laughs> and the molds are pretty reliable still, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Mainly, I'm just doing a bunch of these operations just to fill that data store so I can get to the point of uh, showing you actual low-level REST API access via curl. So if we do vulns, we also see that was something that was recently converted. We have vulnerabilities listed. But if we were to drop over, so we, we can see all of that within Metasploit. However, if we go over to another terminal, I could then use curl and hit that endpoint and get back hosts, for example. Hmm. So here's me curling for the host and then piping it through JSON tool to preprint it. On that terminal, we see that the host that we saw in MSF console is now here as JSON data uh, via the endpoint. Kind of the same thing you go through all the different endpoints we have. So I created a bunch of services. Here's the services being returned via the services endpoints. Uh, maybe just to step it up a little bit, show that there's actually more interaction than just getting these values. I could look at the single vuln that I retrieved, uh, or single vuln that was registered over here. If we were to go back here and look, I get it. I see that it's stored with uh, identifier of two. And let's say that I want to just test this REST API and do an update for that vuln uh, entry. So here I can curl, uh, and basically our updates are handled through put operations. And this is going to say, OK, I want to update the info value to test update for, well, didn't copy it. Oh, two. Yeah, I need to update it for volume two. There. But so we get back the volume entry. I could do a quick retrieval on that and see that it's updated here. Via the REST API, or better yet, let's just drop back into MSF console, rerun volumes, and see that the info there shows test update. Sweet. So the idea is like you're starting to see that we have all the pieces in place, so you can interact with it from as a REST API. Um, you know, just trying to give you guys an update to see that there are a lot more of the models are available now, and notes and workspaces are. Near PR, so we're, we're closing down on the models that are left. I think all we have left after that is credits. Yep. That's there is a reason not. that didn't use the patch command or the patch HTTP method? We just decided to go with puts for updates. OK. Since put generally is a replace, sure. patch would be for a partial update, semantically speaking. We'll look into it. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Uh, so we've got one more. I don't remember, was it Sunny? I think Sunny was on the list too. Yeah. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. All right. Let's see what. All right. All right, we should uh, be able to see the Metasploit Pro interface. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So what I'm going to demonstrate today is the Metrpreter 64-bit payload support. Um, what I'm going to try to do is uh, run a credential domino. My first step here is to get the right name of the target, and I'm going to open a session. So we added uh, to the dropdown the Meterpreter 64-bit uh, option. I'm going to go ahead and do a bind. And I know the creds of this by heart. So we'll go ahead and run the module. And if all goes well, we will get a session. 
Yay, one session's open. Okay, so bear in mind here, it's gonna be uh, some steps to be able to get and run the credential domino module with the 64-bit payload. Gonna have to copy and paste some targets. Okay, the scope. Right. Charge of addresses, the exclude address. Okay, my address. If you need that, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why it decides my. Address. I guess because it's I'm I'm excluded. <laughs> right. So there's the high value host. I think I have these fields uh, all correct, and then the settings. So. We also added the Metropiter 64-bit dropdown to this payload setting. Um, and if all goes well, let us see, find, and we'll go ahead and launch. So it's running Credential Domino in the background right now. And I'm gonna pull up the task log because what I wanna show here we go. Is notice that it's loading the Mimikatz extension, and this is evidence that 64-bit payloads uh, payload is being used because Mimikatz can only run uh, with the 64-bit payload. If it's not there, then it gives you a message like, "Oh, Mimikatz can't run uh, with that." So, as we are waiting to collect the hosts, if all goes well, we'll get three. Does take a little bit of time. And if we don't don't get three, it's not pro. Say it again, Jeffrey. Said if we don't get three, it's not pro. It's we need to reboot one of them. Okay. Can we look at the task What's going on the second iteration? I believe there's three total. Ah, there we go. There we go. So uh, this is pretty much the the expected outcome. We've got the the deck designated high value host. Uh, basically, we started with this host and we dominoed all the way to this high target. Um, so that concludes the interpreter 64 bit uh, payload demo. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> And that makes it that, I mean, given that like 95 to 99% of what Windows hosts you'll see in the world these days will all be 64 bit, um, this is a really very useful target. I, I would almost say we should make it the default, except probably like the Windows XP demos would require someone to tweak it to make that work. But um, other than that, I mean, this is, this is fantastic work. Thanks a lot, Sonny. Yeah, sure when thing. We move to 128 bit architecture, mm -hmm. then we'll make 64 bit the default. Mm, I think we might go to 96 first. That's yeah. my okay. prediction. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, that's all the demos I have down. Do we have any last minute additions or? No, I think we're good. Okay. Just send, just run right around an hour. Outstanding. Well, thank you, everybody. Great work. Thank you.